You're listening to Managing Leadership Anxiety, Yours and Theirs, a podcast offered in partnership with Missio Alliance. Each episode, we discuss internal and relational pressures, how they block effective leadership, and how we can move through them to a greater health. And now your host, Steve Cuss. Friends, you survived. We're in season six. Here we go, 2021. Hey, I've got a guest, uh, Dr. John Chastine. I, I'm really excited about John coming on the show. We've gotten to know each other off the microphone, uh, just with some shared affinity. And I, I would say our affinity is around uh, how a leader stewards their emotional pain for their ministry. And John has a lot of experience in it. He uh, wrote a book on that that we're going to get into. The other reason I was excited about John coming on the show, he is both a university president and a lead pastor. Uh, the church he leads is, is quite sizable, so he has a sizable staff. But, you know, if, if we were chatting, if John came on the show in 2019, we could have just talked just about university leadership. There's no picnic. But now we're on the other side of 2020. And so here we have a leader, guys, that we can learn from who's had to navigate what was already you know, higher education leadership is rapidly changing. So it was already a difficult challenge. And then I would describe in my own life, 2020 was probably in my top three toughest years as a church leader. So I'm so glad that John's joined us. Uh, John, uh, also, I should just name your book, uh, Half the Battle. It, it is a book written for people who want to understand their pain, how their pain impacts their life. As I read it, I, I just felt like it was secretly written to faith leaders. Uh, I think so much of what you wrote, John, is for faith leaders. So welcome to the show. Oh, Steve, I'm so honored to be on your show. I'm a big fan of your podcast, and I'm a big fan of your book. One of the ways that I survived 2020 was reading your book, Managing Leadership Anxiety. It helped me so much. I'm passing it to my teams and required reading for my leaders. Uh, so thank you for your investment in me, but it's an honor to be on your show. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad. So, John, uh, we're actually uh, kicking up with Q&A. Before we get to your material, I'm actually asking some of my guests to help me with people who are asking me for help. So we got a question in from a gentleman named Phil. Phil's been a lead pastor for a while. And I'm just going to read the question, and then I'll have you answer it, then I'll answer it, and uh, then we'll jump into your book. Awesome. Here's what Phil said. He said, I'm wondering if you've seen anxiety grow with years in leadership. Hmm. I know I've felt more anxiety in the past year than maybe all of my years combined. And obviously, 2020 was anxiety producing. Yeah. But I wonder if you've explored the cumulative effect of anxiety. When I think on my early leadership, I don't know if it was hubris or ignorance or naivete, but I just didn't seem to struggle with anxiety. Hmm. I also had way fewer responsibilities as a young leader. Now I'm married with a mortgage and three kids and just more responsibility in my work. So John, Phil's asking us uh, the cumulative impact of anxiety. Do you, do you notice anxiety more now than when you started? I think, I, I, Phil, I think it's a great question. First off, I think, um, I think that word cumulative is a really good word for that because I, I, I find that to be somewhat true. I think, you know, when you first get into ministry and any sort of leadership, no matter what leadership it is, there's this, it almost feels like there's this grace period, like it's a honeymoon phase, you know? I started here at the King's University in July of 2018. And for about a year, I was like, you know what? Everyone's got grace on me. I'm the new guy. Um, but as it as it goes on, it compounds because there's this pressure of, okay, I've been the lead pastor for five years or 10 years or 15 years. And what's the next thing that I have to quote unquote do to prove that I'm still worthy of leading this organization? And so I think that's a real thing. I think that's a, a legitimate thing. I will say that my path might have been a little bit different because when I be, whenever I became a lead pastor, I was just a campus pastor, and it was a, a, a large multi-site church that I had no ambitions of ever being a lead pastor. And then the founding pastor had a moral failure, and all of a sudden, within a matter of weeks, I was an interim senior pastor, and then a senior pastor, and only preached a handful of times. And you know, all the things that come with moral failures, financial hardships, people leaving the church. And so I would say my my anxiety levels were pretty high on the front end, and I really had to learn how to cope with that quickly, almost like your stories that you talk about in your book about your chaplaincy. I had to kind of cope with that really quick. But overall, to answer Phil's question, I would say that that is completely normal, at least in my experience, um, which is all the more reason it's important as leaders to continue to, to combat this. And that's probably why your book ministered to me so much in one of the most 
anxiety filled years in history, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I really appreciated this question too, because I, I, I always hate to give the impression that I don't struggle with anxiety because I struggle with it every day. Le- leadership yeah. anxiety. I don't have, I don't think I have a medical condition, but just the pressures of leadership. Yep. And uh, my answer, Phil, would be uh, over Christmas break, I got three texts or emails from people saying, we need to meet. It's about the church. Let's meet right away. Kind of that, that <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, John, your reaction. <laughs> this is the nightmare text for any pastor. Tightening gut, spinning head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the third one, I, I managed two of them quite well. I did my work and I met, met at peace. But the third one, I just replied back and said, I need to know what we're meeting about because mm-hmm. I don't want to have to wonder between now and then. Mm-hmm. And, and so I would just say to Phil, there really is something to the cumulative effect. Um, because what I do, you know, 25 years in ministry, 16 in a lead chair, every time somebody has emailed or texted me, it, there is a sense that some of that is showing back up with the next email or text. The 16 years of those texts, wow. there's kind of a, it's not a trauma, that's a too strong a way to say it, but there is a cumulative impact where I get, it almost feels like I'm, I'm more triggered and more afraid than when I first started because of all the years of it, I guess. I think it compounds, you know, and even, I think it can even compound throughout the day. So, you know, if we're good at releasing anxiety, maybe we release it when we go to bed at night. But even throughout the day, if I have one email and then one call and then one confrontation, by the end of the day, I can be so wound up that I, I leave differently at 4 p.m. than I did at 8 a.m. Oh, and, wow. and my teams have even learned for me that, you know, Tuesdays are bad days. Mondays are bad days. The day after I preach, I'm emotionally drained. Uh, I don't know that that's specifically anxiety, but I think our staffs even learn, okay, don't talk to John at 4 p.m. I, I need to get that 8 a.m. appointment. Because <laughs> there's <laughs> yeah. a compounding effect, you know. Yeah, that's a good word. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, hey, listeners, uh, just a, a quick plug. Um, the, the reason we can address these questions is we have this new online community called Capable Life. You can visit www.capablelife.me. It's it really the place. It's an online confidential community where all of the stuff we talk about on this podcast is in video form, little 10-minute videos. We do monthly Zoom calls with coaches. And uh, you can submit a question or a case uh, like Phil did. So if you are looking for community, let, let me just say this, guys. 2021 is not going to be different than 2020 unless you do something different. And so with, with Launch Capable Life, it is based on my book, MLA, um, but it's, it's interactive. And right now we have, I don't know, as of this recording, like 80 members from six different countries. We have missionaries. Quick shout out to Croatia and Madagascar. Hey, guys. Um, but this is where you can submit these questions. So you can go there to check out more. John, let's get into your book. You mentioned, even in answering Phil's question, being thrust into ministry early. Early in your book, you actually give an example of having to come in after this lead pastor had had this failure. You're now the lead pastor, all the mistrust. And one of the associate staff came into your office and, and dumped his pain on you. I really love the way you reacted. I wonder if you just tell us what happened there. Yeah, you can, as you can imagine, you know, the the sort of an incident in a church, in a twenty year old church, and the founding pastor, um, and he was, you know, was a great man of God. He is a great man of God to this day. He just made a mistake, and and the ripple effect of that, and the emotional wake that that leaves in everybody. But there was one particular day that a a staff um, came in and. The, you know, the his, there was a history there. He had been asked to move his family there. There was a lot of, you know, expectations that weren't met, you know, and which can be the the <laughs> that soil that, that pain and hurt can fester in pretty easily. And so he was just really worked up and he came in after an all staff and was just kind of giving it to me, you know. And my anxiety was high. And I don't know that I realized it then, but looking back on it now, I, I think that it was very high. And I really, I really think it was just the Lord leading me in that moment. But I said, instead of I didn't say one word back. I didn't defend myself. All I said was, "I'm sorry." Um, and he stopped and he looked at me. He was like, "What? What are you talking about?" I said, "I'm sorry that the way this shook out for you, that you were promised things, you moved your whole family here, you, you know, you were promised a position that you didn't end up getting." And then lo and behold, the person who promised you all this stuff is all of a sudden gone and you're in this unknown space. 
and it, it was instant tears. He went from it went from lashing, screaming, yelling to instant flowing of tears. And and I think that, that was a really important lesson for me to learn as a as a very young leader was um, I think our initial response to pain um, when people put pain on us, our initial response is to put pain back on them. <laughs> you know, don't talk to me that way. And we have this, we have this, uh, I don't know if it's pride or what it is, Steve, but it's like this, we have to defend ourselves at all costs instead of coming from a pastoral standpoint point of seeing behind the veil. And really anytime we see people that are coming at us with any sort, even the guy that flipped you off going down the road, there is something going on. It, it wasn't you cutting him off that started this, right? There's always something else that caused this inflammation to occur. And I think as, as leaders, it's upon it's on us to really be able to calm ourselves in those moments of anxiety and think rationally and respond rationally with calm and addressing that person and their place of pain. So that was a big, a big learning experience for me. I think why I really love that story is I think it's the common struggle in faith leaders that people project onto us their pain and it always feels accusing to the faith leader and the way you were able to get past that and, and help this person. Let, let's flip it the other way, John. Uh, these one-off encounters that work well like that, it's a great example, but there's also times where people constantly are caricaturing you as a leader and they simply don't see who you are over time. Like they're always putting their pain on you. Have you had a situation like that where you're having to try to help one of your congregants see that you're a human being, you're not a punching bag, for example? I think those those sort of things happen all the time and they, they're really hard to um, diagnose at times, but I you know, one of the one of the things I go into the book it, pretty in depth. I have to devote a whole chapter to it. Is something that I've really become obsessed with. Is this idea of rejection, and rejection is such a thing that uh, I think it's one of the greatest tools of the enemy, Steve. I think it's something that is a tiny seed that's planted. And what I found is that just about in every situation, whether someone is lashing out at me, whether somebody is, you know, acting inappropriately on my staff or whatever the case may be, even, even getting into addictions and things of that nature. If you'll, if you'll peel that layer of that onion back far enough, what you'll find is, is somebody who's, who has or is experiencing extreme rejection. And it's, it's like God created us to be accepted. And that's why we want to be accepted in everything that we do. We want to be accepted on social media. We want to be accepted with our spouse. We want to be accepted by our boss. And when we experience these moments of rejection, uh, it can have, crazy effects. I, I In my book, I went into the study uh, that was done um, by, by a guy named Dr. Dr. Winch, who actually did MRI studies of the brain and found that the same neuropathways in our brain that, that deliver physical pain are the same neuropathways that are, that are where, where we experience rejection. And so he literally concluded his research by saying, perhaps a broken arm is not so different than a broken heart. And so the, the physical effects um, that happen. So, so I kind of, I didn't tell you a specific example of a, of a specific story, but I think it's what I'm trying to get a point to the listeners across the listeners is this is rampant that every day, if somebody doesn't reply to your text message, if somebody doesn't comment on your social media page, if you worked for a business for 15 years and then you got laid off, that's rejection. If, if you're a spouse and you need physical affection from your spouse and they don't give it to you, that's rejection. If you're, if you're, if you need emotional, you know, emotional love, and we all have different love languages and your boss or your coworker or your spouse doesn't give you that, you experience this rejection that does significant damage to how we think and how we live our lives. Yeah, I think it was actually uh, the same person just referenced, Dr. Guy Winch, you have a quote in the book that says, rejection is a greater risk for adolescent violence than drugs, poverty, and gang membership. That was actually, that was actually the, the U.S. Surgeon General in 2001. This U.S. Surgeon General concluded that rejection was a greater risk for adolescent violence, poverty, and, and drugs, and gang membership combined. Uh, because it's everywhere, you know, it's everywhere. And we've, we've, we experience rejection at every turn. Um, and it's all throughout Scripture. As I as I read through the Scriptures, I begin to find that it's all through Scriptures. The, this idea of rejection and how God wants to—we're children of God. What does it mean to be a child? It means you are accepted. You are 
part of the family. And, and that's what it means to be in the family of God. And so what does the enemy want to do? The enemy wants to come to separate us. He wants to come to show us that we are not a part or to convince us that our mistakes disqualify us. And I, you know, it started as a ministry thing as a pastor, Steve, and I, I wrote a lot of this book because of the people that I would try to pastor and I would do marriage counseling. I would do all these different things. And they would always come back to this little seed of rejection, whether they were adopted as a child, whether they were abused, a father that should have, you know, a father that should have protected them, abused them, or a mother that should have cared for them and loved them, rejected them. So uh, but I'm I'm beginning to realize the impact on leadership, Steve, of, of how big of a deal this is in leadership. Yeah. And obviously, there's all these micro rejections, like most faith leaders have some kind of a public leadership role, whether it, let's say it's preaching or worship leading, but you're putting yourself out there in a vulnerable way on a regular basis. And I, it does seem like there's a lot of us that just struggle with needing, as you almost become addicted to feedback. Oh my uh, God. Yeah. So talk to us about rejection in faith leadership. Yeah. You and I have talked about this, about preaching and how preaching can do a number. I mean, I know a lot of pastors. I know you do too, Steve. Pastors can be some of the most insecure people <laughs> on planet right. earth because right. we get so used to, and there's this pressure, right? You know, we, we preach every week, every week we study, we pour our heart out. And now more than any ever, our congregant, more than ever, our congregants are listening to you. Mm -hmm. And then they're listening to Craig Rochelle and Stephen right. Furtick and Andy Stanley. And there's this comparison trap that we put ourselves in and this pressure that we feel. And so we get so wound up with, oh, pastor, that was such a great message. And then the next week, nobody says anything. And we're, we do these own calculations in our mind of, well, I guess, I guess that one was bad. And so we can actually reject people without even knowing it. Like, that's what was been so mind boggling to me is if you were expecting me to text you today and I didn't, you were rejected and I didn't even know that I was rejecting you. So it's everywhere. It's, it's all through scripture. It's all through our lives. It's day in, day out. If, if I would have logged on to this podcast today and you weren't there, I'd have been like, oh, Steve, I guess Steve doesn't like me. I guess I'm not a good enough leader. I'm not a big enough name. <laughs> you know, the rabbit holes that we go down, it's crazy. Yeah, you, you write this, really beautiful theology of rejection in, in the book where you, you pull out the concept of how Jesus is the cornerstone that the builders rejected. I, I, obviously, yeah. that's out of context because through the book, you're weaving stone metaphors with the stone and Lazarus in the tomb. Mm -hmm. but you conclude it with this, what's really a powerful passage of scripture that the Jesus who doesn't reject us was rejected. Yeah. I just hear what you want to tell us about that. Yeah, so that that's that story, kind of what I unpack in that story, and I'll do it quickly, it, is that story, the story of Lazarus and Mary and Martha experience rejection because they sent word to Jesus to come heal Lazarus, and they've known yeah. Jesus as a healer. And so, like, well, surely Lazarus is his friend. If he's going to heal anybody, he'll heal a stranger. Surely he'll heal his friend. And he doesn't show up. And so that's rejection. We expected something that didn't happen. We were rejected. And so part of the book is walking people through this pain of escorting Jesus to our place of pain because Jesus shows up on the scene and Martha comes out, you know, I'm sure with her hand on her hip and says, Jesus, you should have been here. And if you would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. So you can, you can sense the pain and the rejection in her heart. And Jesus walks her through this journey of saying, show me your pain. And he says, take me to the place. Take, take me to where you have put him. And this is what, so Mary and Martha did what, with their pain, what we do with our pain. When we feel rejection, it stinks and we don't like it. And it hurts if a father rejected us, if a mother rejected us, if a coworker rejected us. And so we just, what they did with Lazarus's body, they stuck it in a dark place and they rolled a stone in front of it. And so they, they didn't know how to deal with the pain. This, the stench was too great. Later on, Jesus would say, roll the, st roll the stone aside and their reply was, no, Jesus, the stench is so bad. Yeah. And so when we harbor and put pain in, in the dark recesses of our lives, it becomes pretty stinky too because it gets infected. And that's that one name that if anybody mentions around you, you just go off because you're like, oh, I hate that person or whatever pain that is. And so Jesus walks them through this pain. And so I, I, I walk through that about how Jesus wants to you know, resurrect the things in us that are dead. But really, one of the greatest epiphanies I had was this in this idea of rejection 
was a couple times in, in scripture, one time it's in the book of Psalm, is, is talking about Jesus, and it says that he was the stone that the builders rejected. And that, I, I remember the day I read that, and it, you know, passages we've read a hundred times, but that day it's like jumping off the page. Because you think about Jesus come to show us how to deal with rejection. If anybody experienced rejection, it was Jesus. He was rejected from while he was still in his mother's womb. It says that there was no room at the end. This guy was rejected before he was ever born. He was rejected from the day he was born. He wanted to be, he, they wanted to kill him from the day he was born. The Sadducees rejected him. The Pharisees rejected him. The, the Greeks rejected him. The Romans rejected him. The Jews rejected him. His own people rejected him. And, and what, did, what does it say? It says that that stone has now become the chief cornerstone. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, it talks about how this stone that the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. So our entire faith, the, the faith in which we believe, is built on the foundation of something called rejection, that these cornerstones were so important back then. They didn't have stem walls and foundations. The cornerstone was the stone, the most important stone of the entire structure and Jesus was the stone that, that now makes up the body of Christ that we're a part of. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees walked through the query for the right cornerstone. And they looked at Jesus and said, that is not the Messiah. We reject him. And that rejection became a cornerstone. And so it just gives us an example, Steve, of what do we do with our rejection? Okay. Okay. You were abused as a child. Your father abused you. You know what? Je you might be like Martha. Jesus should have been there. And why did I have to go through a divorce? And why did I get molested? But maybe maybe these these times of rejection, if we'll lay them down, that's what cornerstones are meant. You're not supposed to carry cornerstones. They're just too heavy. They're not meant to care, be carried. If we would lay it down, maybe God could build something really great out of it. And that's the power of a testimony, right? Somebody who's been abused, they make really good counselors for others who, who are being abused. So that's kind of that illustration that's that's woven through through the book there. And it's so important for leaders to understand this about themselves. Where have I been rejected? And how is that impacting the way that I lead my teams? But it also has devastating effects on how you lead your teams. So imagine if you have a staff member who's expecting something out of you and you, quote unquote, reject them. You don't do that. So we have to be careful how we lead because we are inflicting pain on people that is a seed that's manifesting the fruit uh, in their lives of bitterness and hate and and all unforgiveness and all those things coming back to the seed of rejection that I as a leader might have inflicted. It's a sobering thought. Yeah, it really is. And I'm actually really glad that we're, we're grabbing you early in 2021 because I'm haunted the amount of faith leaders I talked to in 2020 that were literally at the end of their rope, they just were really running on fumes. And I'm just haunted that they, they're going to roll into 2021 either not doing anything differently or not believing things can actually be different. And you, you write, you give quite a bit of time to the importance of intentionality and, and you do it through the phrase of shaking it off. You talk about in the Bible with Paul in the book of Acts and in the Gospels, yeah. the idea of in, the intentionality of shaking off. I'd love to hear just your word yeah. from faith leaders on that this year. Yeah, that, that happens, you know, through the New Testament, the book of Acts is always like, if you go into a town and they don't accept you, shake off the shake dust. Off. Shake, yeah. Because you're not supposed to carry that with you. But one of the more powerful ones I love is in the Old Testament. You know, we know the story of Jacob and Esau. And Jacob gets the blessing. He steals the blessing. We, we you know, he... He pretends, we know the story, people, your listeners know that story well, but one of the fascinating parts of that story is we kind of forget about Esau because the story kind of goes on with Jacob, but there's this really powerful point in that story where, um, where Esau goes to his father and he says, please, is there, is there just some kind of blessing that you could give me? And what does he experience? Rejection. He's like, nope, sorry, there's nothing left. But then his father says something super powerful he says, but if you will shake this yoke from off your neck. And so what a powerful illustration, what a powerful picture of what we're to do as leaders. He says, but if only, but if, if you can shake this yoke of bondage, if you can shake this rejection from off your neck. And so I believe the scripture is not implicit, 
But I believe that Esau went on to live a very blessed life. And the reason I think that is because later on, Jacob goes to confront him and Jacob tries to give him all of these flocks and all of these goats and sheep and, and such. And Esau says, I don't need it. Yeah, I don't need it. I'm good. So I just think that there's a blessing out there for us. And so often, Steve, we carry this pain as leaders and we try our best to lead and we try our best to fight battles in front of us. And what I'm beginning to realize is that God is far more interested in, in our spirituality in our relationship with him than he is our circumstances, you know, in, in this temporal life, he's way more interested in our, in our eternity. And he's he, at, at least for my life, maybe, maybe nobody else, but at least for my life, I've learned that he comes to deal with me spiritually before he deals with me physically. If that makes sense. He, he comes to deal with the battle inside of me before he fixes or, or fights the battle on the outside. He, there's a greater battle. And that's what the, really the, the idea of this book is half the battle. Fighting the battles that you face, it's just half the battle. And in fact, if that's the only battles you ever fight is trying to get your offerings up and trying to grow your church and trying to do this and all the circumstances that we as pastors try to focus our time on, that's only half the battle. The, the greater battle, the much more difficult, the much bloodier battle is the one that we, that we have to fight on the inside of dealing with these pains. Yeah, you're making the very simple but difficult case that what a leader carries infects their team, their organization. Mm -hmm. And if they're not dealing with what they carry, they're going to transmit it and, and do damage. And one of the areas you focus on that's always been a fascination for me in my leadership work is generational pain. Yeah. Uh, you use the story of the Israelites and, and fleeing Egypt. Yep. And you talk about the Israelites who were born in the wilderness were still carrying the shame of their parents from the yeah. Egypt slave days. It's my paraphrase of what you said. Yeah. Talk to us about how a leader can understand the shame they've inherited that they will transmit if they can deal with it. Yes, I, I became obsessed with the story. And again, it was kind of one of those epiphany moments. I'm, I'm reading through the Bible, the, the one-year Bible, reading the Bible, and I come to this one passage in Joshua chapter 5. And before I do it, I'll set it up. So they leave Egypt, you know, they go all through the wilderness. We know the, the generation changes and they get to the banks of the Jordan River and they're, they cross over to the other side. And then the Bible says at the end of chapter four, beginning of chapter five, God says, circumcise yourselves. And you're like, oh man, what a horrible, horrible illustration, you know, like what in the world grown men having to go up and get circumcised. But the Bible says that that generation had never been circumcised. So you have to remember what circumcision means. It, it, it is a sign of acceptance. It is saying you are a child of God. It is a covenant relationship. And so when they go into the promised land, all, they go, all they're going to do is fight battles. All they're going to do, they're going to fight at Jericho and Ai and the northern kingdoms and the southern kingdoms. And so the promised land is a battleground. And so God is saying to them, before you fight a physical battle, First, you're going to fight a spiritual battle. And on the banks of the Jordan River, I believe was the hardest battle they fought before they ever went to Jericho, before they ever went to Ai. I think they a, fought a battle on the inside because the Bible says circumcise yourself. By the way, what a weird illustration. God could have used any symbolism possible. And for some reason, as, pre as preachers, we have to preach circumcision, which is just awkward. But you got to <laughs> think about the, even the beauty in that symbolism, Steve. What would a grown man have to do to get circumcised by another grown man. <laughs> One, you would have to humble yourself. You talk about vulnerability. And, <laughs> yes. and in the New Testament, God circumcises our heart, right? So what does it take? It takes vulnerability. Um, in, in the Old Testament, they would have had to expose themselves. Pardon the awkwardness there. What do we have to do in the New Testament? We have to expose the hurt and pain in our heart. And so... God deals with them on the banks of the Jordan River to remind them of this covenant relationship, right? So then this verse, chapter 5, verse 9, uh, this, this passage says, Today, the Lord tells Joshua, Today, I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So after the circumcision, they've been reminded of their covenant. And God says, Today, I've removed Egypt from you. And I was just like, what? That was 40 years ago. Like, yeah. what do you mean you've, re and reproach in Hebrew means shame. So 
God is saying, today I've removed the shame of Egypt from you. So, so not only was that 40 years ago, but the people that he was telling that to had never even stepped foot in Egypt. They, that was their parents. They, they had never felt the sting of a whip on their back, not once. But they grew up seeing the scars from the whips on their parents' backs. And so God was saying to them, look, you're about to go in and fight some battles, but I don't want you to go in with the mentality of a slave. I want you to go into battle with the mentality of a child of God. This was such a revolutionary text for me that just being able to transform um, the way I thought and the way I led, uh, that God wants to cut away, using the analogy of circumcision, what does he need to cut away from my heart? What pains, what unforgiveness, what bitterness, what pain am I carrying? And before I could ever expect the walls of Jericho to fall on the outside, I first have to let the walls fall around my heart. And so it was really just this beautiful picture that God puts in his scriptures, as he always does, of this, I call it a physical picture of a spiritual truth. It's a physical picture that we get in this text, but it's a spiritual truth that we're to apply to our lives. And I believe that they wouldn't they wouldn't have gone on to conquer all of those kingdoms if they wouldn't have first fought the hardest battle they would ever face, the one that was on the inside. Yeah, John, I that's what I really appreciated about the book is, you, you know, you're a doctorate of education. You, you've got some game, but at, at heart, you are a pastor. And yeah. so what you're offering in the book is you're taking a lot of metaphors from actual events in the Bible and really, I, I feel like helping us in the modern 21st century, more psychologically aware culture we live in nowadays, helping us apply these historical events in what I felt was really healing. And I, I think my hope is particularly for leaders, you know, the majority of my listeners are faith leaders of some kind. Unless you do something different this year, this year's going to be the same as last year or worse. Yeah. It's not, nothing's going to change outside us. It's only that internal transformation. I really feel like in half the battle, you gave us a really, um, I don't know, just a, a, a very healing journey that we can all go on. I, I really appreciated that. I so I, that. It, it yeah, well, me and, and I hope I, it helps I, others because it helps me. <laughs> I, I hope so too. Yeah, it, it's obviously personal. I mean, I think that comes through in the book too. You are writing that which you have experienced. It's not, it's not theoretical. Yeah. It's kind of bizarre. Like you're like, you're the president of a seminary and a university. Why are you writing a book on <laughs> healing your hidden hurts? Like what, what do you, but it, it really was just this thing that God walked me through and, and people that I, everybody, everybody that I would share this with, or I'd preach a sermon on it. It would just, it would just wreck people. And so I knew that it was something that God was putting in my heart to share, to help leaders uh, and, and lay people. Yeah. So I've got a, a left field question for you, John. Uh, season six, just by by nature of our scheduling, has an overabundance of white guys. And as a fellow white guy, um, I, I'm, I, I've been on a journey of listening to people of color and anybody who's not a white guy, really since the 1990s. It, it was profound for me in seminary. One of my New Testament professors was from Barbados. The other one was Ethiopian. And my Ethiopian professor, Kip Delia Alolia, his name is. I remember the first day of class, we get in there and he says, look, guys, I tell you what you don't need is another book written by another white guy. Wow. And I was young and he opened my eyes and our eyes to what it's like to be not white. And mm -hmm. so in season six, just by nature of our scheduling, we, we have mostly white gentlemen, excellent people to learn from. Yeah. But I am interested in us learning together so here's, in that context, here's my question. You wrote in the book, you, you're a six foot seven guy. So, mm -hmm. so you're tall, you've got a deep yeah. voice, you're a white fellow. You, you are in many ways the very center of power. I'd yeah. love to hear your own learning journey of the yeah. impact of that or the impact of your team or what you've learned. Just any response you have to that. Yeah, this is such an important topic, and I, I appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, 2020 taught us all so, so much in so many ways, but I, I really would think if I went back, um, if, as I think back in 2020, I think I learned more in this realm than any other thing. I'll tell a, I'll tell a story to kind of illustrate it. It, hasn't to do with, it doesn't have to do with race, but it has to do with gender, and it really made me begin to think differently. When I got to the King's University, I have a, a president's cabinet, 
that's made up of uh, several people and two of them are women. Right. So I had at, at the church, I had never had women on my leadership team. So this was new territory for me. And so I really wanted to kind of have those conversations early on with with these women on, on our team. And, and they're brilliant. These two women on, on my team. Uh, I think every man on my team would agree that they're the smartest ones. <laughs> they're smart. And so one time I was asking one of them in an oversight meeting, I asked them, I said, what does it feel like to be a woman in a meeting? Not not necessarily not ne- not not even necessarily the meetings here, but just in, in in any meeting. And she said, you know, she says I have to be very calculated. If I if I'm too boisterous, then I am a power hungry feminist, you know, that's trying to whatever. If I'm too soft, then I'm I'm weak and I haven't earned my place at the table. And as she was as she was talking, I thought to myself, I have never thought that in my life. I have never, you know, I just blah, <laughs> I just, I just talk. And then, um, so that was really revolutionary to me. And then one time I was, I was about to do a panel with a, a couple of guys uh, during this, during this crisis time, a couple of African American, African American brothers, one of them being Michael Jr. I don't know if you know who Michael Jr. is. He's a comedian. He's a yeah. great guy. He's a friend of mine. Guy. Yeah. I love this guy. And so we're in my office before we go out and we're just talking. And it's like me and one other white guy. And then two or three African American, um, one one African American woman, a couple African American men, and he said, "I have a question." And it was just random, like it was so off the wall. He said, "How many of you have ever been told that you're articulate?" Hmm. And I was like, "No." He goes, I, "He goes, John, have any, has anybody ever told you that you're articulate?" And I said, "No." And then he said, "Okay, by show of hands, who has been told that they're who has never been told that they're articulate?" Both the white people raised their hand. Okay, now who has been told that they are articulate? And all the black people raised their hand, right? So what he was saying without saying a word was everybody assumes that black people shouldn't be articulate. Yeah. They're surprised. I, They're saying, I'm surprised that you're articulate. Yes. I sat back in my chair. That was another slap me upside the head moment. And so I think what I've learned more than anything else, both you know, from, from that topic, but even just leadership in general, Steve, is I got to shut up. (laughs) I got to, I got to close my mouth way more often. And as a six, seven male, like it or not, there are privileges, you know, and there's a reason why the Bible says that Saul was head and shoulders above the rest. And there's actual studies that show that tall people have more favor than short people. Yeah. And white people have more privilege than than non-white people. So I think, you know, it's important for white males during this this time to use our voice for good for good. And uh, I, I know when all of this first inflamed in 2020, I know a lot of white pastors that just didn't know what to say. So they just didn't say anything and they wouldn't say anything from the platform. They just kind of stuck their head in the sand and pretend like it wasn't happening because there is this fear of, well, I'm going to say the wrong thing. And it's going to be more damning than if I wouldn't have said anything. So I think there's this vulnerability and this acknowledgement that needs to take place. So I'm, I'm curious, Steve, you're no short guy yourself. What has that been similar to? I mean, what are your thoughts? I would love to learn from you. Yeah, I, I think my journey, I think it's dangerous when you're affirmed as a teenager for your gifts and you are unaware of your personal power. I think when you then get into ministry, in your early 20s, for example, you become unlivable, you know, because mm. you, you don't know. You, you just, you're yeah. swimming in a, in a water that you just are not aware of. And so I, I think my own personal journey, I thought I was aware after seminary because I had non-white professors who made us engage non-white voices. I came out of yeah. seminary thinking, oh, I'm aware. And, and so I remember being exposed to the concept of privilege in the 90s and immediately understanding it. On my own personal journey, I chased Aboriginal theology, which is mm-hmm. obviously the non-white theology of Australia. And I had to grapple with my own uh, racial issues, my own racism that I wasn't even aware of. Wow. So it's like I did all that work in the 90s. And then sometime in the mid-2000s, uh, probably around Ferguson, I think for me, I realized I'm actually not doing any of that work because it doesn't cost me. Like I can, I can live my life 
without having to do that work. And so I get busy and forget. Yeah. And so, was, so that, I think Ferguson was around 2014. I remember being part of a clergy group in town. The governor had asked us all to start meeting and to get to know each other, be, become friends. And a very similar experience that you shared with Michael Jr. But the, the African-American pastor, his name is Del, Del Phillips. He's a, he's a legendary, revered pastor in our city. Del said to us, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, you fit the description? Wow. Yes. Same test. And I'm like, what is that phrase? <laughs> like, that's how naive. Yep. And yep. every, of course, every black man in the room put his hand up. There was a, a black preacher named Tawana Davis. She's a fireball of a preacher. She and I were teaching our kids to drive at the same time. She talked about all that she does every day when her son's going to go out and drive, that she checks all the lights on the car hmm. and, and, and how to diminish himself if he gets pulled over to not be a threat to the police. And you know, our sons were the same age. And I said to Tuan, I'm like, I've ne- it's all, I, all I say to Bryson is 10 and 2, buddy. Just 10 mm-hmm. and 2. You'll be f- like, there's nothing to worry about. Yep. So I, I think I'm on a, a fresh yeah. journey of learning. And I think my own personal shame is that I thought I understood and I, yeah. And those conversations are so important, you know, like I, I've got a, a, a black guy that's a, a dear friend of mine. We played college basketball together. We've been friends for 25 years. And um, I remember around this time talking to him and saying, hey, man, help me understand what you experience. And, you know, he, he says, hey, have, let me ask you this question. He said, when you're walking towards a woman in their car, has anybody ever locked their door? Yeah. Ever. And I'm like, no. He goes, well, uh, there you go. And so that's an example. And so, you know, I say that to say listening to people's stories are so important for perspective. Yeah. And I think the more perspective we get, the better leaders will be. And the more aware, I think, I don't think that the, I don't think that the average white male is a racist. The average white male is um, ignorant. Yes. We don't, we just don't know what we don't know. Yes, and, I, I love that. And I think privilege is that we get to be ignorant without costing us anything. That's what in some exactly ways. Exactly right. Yeah. Oh, so good. great. So good. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And, and the more we listen, the, the, the better leaders will be in that process. John, in spite of being a six foot seven man who apparently is athletic, you're going to have to endure the gauntlet of anxiety questions. So I think we're just going to do three or four today. Here's the first one. Would you be willing to tell us about a recent mistake you made and what you tell yourself in your head when you make a mistake? Yeah. So I'll I'll give you one that happened. that's real fresh. So in your book, actually helped me figure this out. So uh, pastors out there can can kind of <clears throat> probably relate to this. So in one day, um, I got two emails. The first email said, if your church requires masks, we're leaving the church. By the end of the day, I got an email that said, if your church doesn't require masks, we're leaving the church. So one email said, if you do require them, we're leaving. The other one said, if you don't require them, we're leaving. I had anxiety. <laughs> I made the mistake of reading the second email at about 1030 at night. Yeah. So couldn't sleep, got up, shot this video to the church saying, da, 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 da. and then I had to have actually one of my campus pastors called me and wrangled me back in. Hey man, chill. Like it's not that big of a deal. So I just made a mistake. I mean, I, luckily it didn't go out there. I didn't react publicly, but it was a massive failure in the moment of, you know, what your book says, what do you do when you don't know what to do? Yeah. <laughs> so that was a, a very fresh mistake um, that I'm sure a lot of pastors could probably relate with. Oh, that's great. Give us a little taste of the story you tell yourself in that moment, John. You get out of bed, your mind's spinning. What are you saying to yourself about yourself? What if? You know, what if? What if they're not the only ones? What if they leave the church? And here's the other mistake that pastors make sometimes, and it was a massive mistake that I should have never done. Not only did I look her up, but I looked up this person's giving record. Okay. I'm being super vulnerable here and pastors are judging me. 
You've done it too. No, I <laughs> so you look at somebody's giving record and you're like, cause, cause really you want to look at, are they involved? Do they volunteer? Cause we get a lot of complaints in church. So is this person truly a part of our church or are they just a passerby? And so, um, so you just, you just spiral, right? I mean, you could probably coach me in this, even in the moment It starts small. And then by the end of the conversation in your head, you're in, you're in pieces and you're just trying to pick up the pieces. Yeah. So I think those things just spiral in those moments and we don't just stop and, and pause and say, wait a minute, even if they do, even, even if they do, it's not the end of the world. We're still a good church. We're not, you know, so those are probably some of the things that spin in your head just in those moments, in those opening moments. Yeah. You know, you write about in your book about uh, family of origin and generational carrying generational baggage. What would be one trait that you've inherited from your family of origin that's really an asset in your leadership? And then what's one trait that gets in the way? Uh, one trait that is really, really beneficial to me is I grew up in a ridiculously healthy home, um, even on this topic. It's ironic that I wrote this book on past pain. Not that I'm not that I'm pain free. We all have issues and pain, but I grew up in a really healthy home. My dad was a pastor. And, you know, I've, ne- you know, I've never heard my dad say a cuss word in my entire life. I've never seen my dad lose his temper in his entire life. So I'm, I'm able to, to lead without a lot of baggage. And I would say that that's something that I'm really mindful of. And I, I like to tell people all the time that as a pastor, I, I'm reaping the fruit of the seeds my dad sowed. So my dad always preached small churches, was never in the limelight, never a big name, you know, just kept his head down and did the work of ministry. And I feel like that all of those seeds that he's sown, I get to reap the benefit of. Um, probably a, ba- a downside that I have to really fight against is that my fa- my family is so peaceful um, that we're, we're not assertive. We can, we can lack in assertiveness. We can be such peacekeepers that we don't address issues as soon as they should be addressed. Mm. And so that's something that I'm really working on in myself that I have to be an assertive leader, that I have to find stuff, fix stuff, find stuff, fix stuff. And, you know, I like Craig Rochelle. We're not just the chief executive officer. We're the, we're the chief fixer. You know, we're, we're the, we got to fix, we got to find the problems and fix the problems. So those are probably a strength and a weakness that I, that I've picked up. Ah, oh, that's great. The next question is, I, I find with a lot of faith leaders, there's often a gap between what we believe and what we experience from God. Mm. And sometimes the gap's exacerbated because we proclaim something we don't experience. I, I would say for years, I proclaimed the love of God that I struggled to experience for myself. Mm. A gap in your life between what you believe and proclaim and what you experience. And I don't mean to suggest that it's hypocritical or deceitful. It's simply that you wrestle with a gap. Yeah. So, you know, I'll give you a, a specific one. I think, you know, I've never really wrestled with finances. I've been a tither and a giver from a young age. I've never struggled with accepting that I'm a child of God and that I'm loved. I think it's because I experienced love from a heavenly, from an earthly father. So I see that love in a heavenly father. A lot of those things I, I have not struggled with. But one thing that I've witnessed time and time again, that I know God is able, and I know, I know that he can do it. I know that he does do it, is God is a healer. You know, I've seen God heal people. I've, I've heard stories of God healing people. I've had firsthand experience of God healing people, but I've never been healed, you know, and that's something that I wrestle with. I, I kind of relate to Paul. I prayed three times for this thorn to be taken from my side and I don't have any major ailments. I don't have cancer. I don't have anything bad. And I have bad knees. I played college basketball. I tore my ACL. I got really bad knees. There's been times where I've begged the Lord, Lord, will you just heal my knees? You know, mm-hmm. In times where it's just a minor thing, I, I, I'm sick, I'm whatever. And sometimes I wrestle with that, where I'm like, God, I know you're a healer. So that's a, I think that's a, a really, I'm being vulnerable with you, but I think that's one that I that I would love. I want to experience that. I, I know God's love. I know God's faithfulness. I know God's provision. I've yet to truly experience the healing. And I know that it's there. I know that by his stripes, I'm healed. I proclaim the faith of it. Um, I've seen it work in people's lives. That's one area that probably I'm looking forward to experiencing. Oh, Not that I'm wanting to get sick. <laughs> I, love, I love that. I love the heart behind that answer. All right. The final question 
you know, obviously I do a lot of study on the nature of anxiety, the spiritual nature of anxiety. And one of the things that anxiety cannot coexist with love. One displaces the other. And oftentimes, you know, you're in anxiety's grip because you forget the love of God. Yeah. So whether you want to answer this through the lens of God or another human being, when in your life do you feel most fully loved? Wow. Uh, like, what am I doing in that moment? Yeah, what's happening in that moment? Is it the activity of another person? Some people have answered that it's a particular environment. They'll say, you know, it's when I'm walking in a mountain or other yeah. people say I'm being held by my wife. There's no, there's all kinds yeah. of ways to answer. I think we all experience the love of Christ, the love of God in, in different ways. And it's how you're molded, how you're crafted. There's people who want to paint and that's how they express. And I think, you know, the irony of this is interesting because here I am a seminary and a university president and written a book and all, and I have a doctorate degree in all these academia areas. Um, yet I feel the closest to God. I feel the most accepted and loved by God in worship. I can't play a musical instrument. I'm not even saying that I can carry a tune. But for some reason, I can study God's Word. And I, it's not that I don't feel loved when I study God's Word. I see it. I, I experience it. But when I'm in worship, it's when I have, you know, no doubt, in, if, you know, if there's anything in my faith that is expressed and comes to its fullest potential, it's in worship. It's, it's what brings me to tears, it's what moves me to get on my knees, it's what moves me to lift my hands. It's that, that's probably, for me, the greatest expression um, that I ever feel of God is, is in worship. Yeah. John, this has been a delight. I, I, I knew we would have a great chat. I, I, I am so grateful for the, you took us to some places that were off the radar, and I really am grateful that you did. Thank you very much for sharing your heart with us. Uh, where can people follow up with you if they want to connect with you more? There's a couple of websites. You can go to tku.edu. That's the King's University. You can go to victory.church. That's the the church. I'm on Instagram. That's kind of my main thing. It's just John Chasteen, no H, J-O-N-C-H-A-S-T-E-E-N. Um, I have a podcast. It's called the Church Intention Podcast. Three words. Steve, you've been my guest on that that show. Um, so those are probably the easiest ways to, to track me down. Man, thanks very much. I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Steve. It was an honor. For more resources, visit stevecusswords.com or missyoualliance.org.